we are trying to get spring up here in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, you can tell by the, that hydrangea bush that um, there are little bits of green coming up. There are garden that one of those shots was of our garden with some bulbs coming up. If the voles don't get them, we have voles around here that get them all the time. But hopefully those are um, going to come up. They came up last year, so maybe we got some good chance of having some daylilies and stuff. Um, and then while I'm saying that, my husband is out spreading mulch. So I'm hopefully he will be, he's done blowing leaves and things while we're doing this. So we'll, we'll try. Um, hi, <laughs> I'm Varian Brandon. I am a stranded color work designer here in the um, beautiful mountains of North Carolina. Um, we are, uh, as I said, pushing towards spring, as I say. Um, this podcast, I'm trying a few things. I looked last week and it looked like I was looking off to the left over here somewhere. Um, my husband saw the video from last, I guess it was two weeks ago now. And he said, it's, that's well and good, but you look like you're looking off to the side. So I don't know what that means. So I'm going to try. Supposedly the camera is uh, up here to me. So I don't know. We're going to look. If it looks weird, I apologize. I don't know. Um, we're going to talk about a couple things this week. Um, I told you a little bit about myself last week, which was just enough of me talking. So this week, um, what I'm going to tell you is a couple years ago, maybe two years ago, I did a, uh, series of, um, blog posts on stranded color work. I think there were 17, 18, if you count my ranting about why, why we do stranded color work, which I guess would be another post. But anyway... Um, on stranded color, color work, covering everything from definition to it, and I called it a non-definitive definition because they're all. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, all sorts of different definitions um, that, and everybody is very is very adamant that theirs is absolutely correct. So, you know, they say about um, my husband. As I said, we have beekeepers. We we are beekeepers here. My husband does it more than I do, but they say that if you ask um, ten different beekeepers, there are how to do something or something about bees, you'll get 14 different answers and all of them are correct, depending on who said them. So anyway, um, so we're going to talk about that. What I thought I would do is take those, um, how do I do 18? So 18 different posts that I did and we'll talk about a different one each video so that you can go to the website and read the post and you'll get a taste of it here and probably more examples and uh, a little more explanation for those people who want to hear it on stranded color work um, and we'll talk about that today and we'll get to that in just a second um, the other thing I was going to talk to you about briefly is that it dawned on me that um, as I'm working as I'm knitting as I'm working on samples and things um, I have a tendency to go what I call down the rabbit hole which means that I get off on YouTube, I get off on some television show, I get to start doing some research on something that doesn't have anything to do with knitting, but it has to do with something I'm interested in. So um, I thought maybe you might be interested too. So the, we're talking about down the rabbit hole. Um, I've got to strip put that out of my hand. Um, I will talk about um, kind of what I was, what I have been doing to um, distract myself while I'm knitting away. So we'll talk about that. Um, and the other thing, oh, I had, you know what? I had notes. I think they just disappeared. Oh, anyway, the other thing I was going to talk about is, oh, uh, the update on the cleanup. Um, I've got a little um, clip that I'll show you first. Let's do that. You that it was a lot of me just walking around and it looked like I was just moving things from one place to the other. It felt like I was just picking up one thing from one place and moving it someplace else. And if you've cleaned up any place, I, I, I sincerely hope you have too felt that way. <laughs> that at, at least at first, before you kind of had a plan, um, you felt like you were just moving things from one thing place to the other. I was trying to get, I have a Norman and, a, and I have a lot inordinate amount of um, bags, bags from trade shows, bags from, you know, just any place. It has 
um, you know, Southeastern Animal Fiber Fair, Georgia Alpaca Festival, or Georgia Animal Fiber Festival. Um, I'm not sure you've got them too, but just things that you can get from various places. So I have lots of bags. Um, and I want to keep them because I, you know, at least most of them, because they're a nice reminder of, or souvenir of the event. But as I was going through, they're all over the room. So we're, we're trying to get those together. The one thing I decided is that I, I find I do better with cleaning up by spreading everything kind of around, kind of making it look like it explodes before it kind of goes back together again. And I was getting ready to explode down the hall and which is, I mean, down outside the door, let's put it that way, and into the other guest room, I mean the real guest room, um, and so I can spread it out on the beds, put all the yarn on the beds, and so I can kind of sort through that way. Um, while I worked on all the papers, I've got lots of papers in here, and I need to have a place where I can, you know, put stacks, and these are all of the, you know, business stuff, and this is all of my mother's business stuff, and this is the fun stuff related to knitting patterns. And, and this is the stack of things that um, I don't want to throw away because that's wasteful, but I can cut it into note paper kind of stuff. Um, but I don't have any space to do that. And I was getting ready to spread out into the guest room when um, my brother called and said he and his family, and they've got a eight-year-old and a six-year-old, um, are going to come up for the weekend and uh, we're going to stay down. We have a, my mother, well, the family has a little vacation house down about a mile down the road from us. That's why my husband and I bought this house because it was so close to the other house. And um, I went down there to turn on the water because, I mean, it's a vacation house. So we, wintertime, turned on all, off the water, drained the pipes, did everything like this, turned the water on. And long story short, um, I ended up having to go turn some lights off back down in the basement where I turned the water on and realized that it was... We, I had burst pipes. It was like raining in the uh, one of the little rooms downstairs. Um, and I was like, oh, crud. So I was like having to rush and go turn the water back off again. But it was Friday. They were on their way up here, which means what they ended up doing was spending the night up here at our house, which is fine, except that I had to get the guest room all cleaned up for them. So I couldn't use that to spread out all the yarn. So one excuse after another, right? So anyway, um, so that's the next step is to spread out. So um, you saw the video. It's just me running around. That was the first time I've done time, lap, time lapse, and that was kind of nice um, to kind of see how fast that is. Um, I didn't, actually, I didn't time the time lapse, but I worked for 30, 45 minutes, so I don't know what it boiled down to. You'll see, not long. It, it takes a, and I need to look into whether you can set the limit, whether it's one shot, excuse me, every 30 seconds or every 40 seconds. I mean, whether you can change the duration of when they take the shots. So I'll see about that. So that's, that's that. That's that update. The second update is down the rabbit hole. And down the rabbit hole means is that what I distract myself with while I'm working on projects. Um, one of the things, and, um, and I can tell you all about them right now, but that'll make this incredibly long and then I wouldn't have anything for next episode. So uh, but one of the things I do talk about, is, I mean, I do look into, is a lot of British mysteries. I do those a lot. But the one thing I've discovered recently is a six-part series um, from the BBC. Can you tell? I do a lot of BBC things. Um, from the BBC called A Stitch in Time. And I used to do, I guess you guys don't know that, I used to do costumes for um, the local... Um, theater when I was living in South Carolina, um, the little community theater, I did costumes and, um, to study costume design, um, and costume history. And, uh, so I just find all that fascinating. And if somebody came along and said, um, uh, we can poof you back to when you, you know, started studying and going to school and figuring out what you're going to do. Uh, and you can do anything you want to do, and money was not the object. Um, you know, I would think costume design would just be phenomenal. I mean, to work on on, star, on um, shows like Game of Thrones, like Outlander. Oh, I love the 18th century. So Outlander, um, any of those shows that have these beautiful costumes, be able to create those and to have the budgets to have the war, you know, have the money to buy the cloth and to make... Oh, I would love to do that. So there's the Stitch in Time series. It's a six part. And the hostess is a, um, what do you call him? Oh, not a reenactor. Um, oh, 
oh shoot, I forgot what you call them. Um, the people who are into um, vintage. Oh, she's a vintage um, dress, you know, costume wearer. Um, and she has this sort of red head uh, that comes in a point here. Bangs come to a point like this around and it goes, you know, down like this. But it's, it's um, a beautiful, bright red, carrot red. Um, and she wears just wonderful, <laughs> wonderful clothes herself. But she's also a costume historian. And um, I can't even tell you what her name is right now. I meant to look that up. Oh, I'm not good at this. Anyway, she takes, um, each episode, they take a painting from a different time period and look at the costume in that painting. And she has um, historic costume uh, um, makers, make costume makers. So you know what I mean. Um and she, they, they reconstruct the costume. And sometimes you have, you have, and then while the host person is going out and figuring out how you used to do um, historic dyeing or um, what the, t what was going on at the time period when the costume and the painting was done. Or, so you have, you know, these things where they have one person working over here and then they come back to these people over here while well, the costume makers are looking at the picture at the drawing and going, I mean, at the painting and trying to figure out, okay, is that a pinked edge? And it, how is that draped? And what do you think about it? Is the, is the, you know, is that a set in sleeve? Is it a, you know, so it's fascinating. And the very first show they took a um, suit of Charles II and it's not real elaborate, but it's beautiful um, wool, sort of a this color wool. Um, you know, uh, Charles II would be, help me history people, I should know these things. Charles II is 1600s, 1500s, 1500s, I don't know. Please don't tell anybody I studied that kind of thing. Oh, well, anyway, if that time period, um, knee breeches and you know, all this kind of stuff, fancy things. And then at the end, when the costume is done, the hostess tries it on and kind of gets the feel of what it's like to wear that costume. And which I just find fascinating. I mean, the whole idea of how it goes together, what the decisions that were made. That's what I like about knitting is that people have been doing it for so long. You have the decisions that were made to make that specific costume, which I just find fascinating. Um, and if you don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> just think uh, well, another costume they make is, do you remember, if you've studied any art history, you know that picture of the, there are two merchants in Italy, Venice, maybe, um, or, ooh, they could be Northern, it could be a Van Eyck. Anyway, she's got, um, a, a green, sort of a bottle green dress on uh, with blue under it and she's got the dress all pulled up high and she's holding it way kind of up here and they always say you know is she pregnant and because she's the way she's got her hand resting on this bulk of a of, fi of uh, fabric that she's holding up and he is all in black down to below his knees and he's got this hat on that kind of sits like this if you know the painting you know exactly what I'm talking about um and they recreated her dress and at that time, she, they talk about how when you were wealthy, you just had yards and yards and yards and yards of fabric to the point that she couldn't walk. And, and the, the hostess, when she tries on the dress that's made for her, she has to hold it all up in front of her so she can just walk. And you realize that that's why that woman is holding it all up, holding all the dress up. Otherwise, there's the train, you know, you talk about used to trains in the back of dresses and the front comes to, you know, the ground or right above your shoes. This has a train in the front that's like this long, just to show how much wealth they have. Anyway, they do a lot of that kind of thing. That's called a stitch in time if you're interested at all. Okay, um, stranded color work. And I say that this is this is essentially part one of the um, blog post that's on my website right now, and the plan is to repost all eighteen parts, and then no matter what I do with the blog after that, or no matter what comes in between, if I you know I'll, I'll post them about every two weeks, so that if there's a week in between, I decide to post something. There's going to be a permanent right nav. Yeah, it looks like left, but anyway, right nav button that um, will um, 
will be there so you, you can always find them. Um, and the first episode is called um, An Introduction and Non-Definitive Definition. And I, I say that because um, there are many definitions of, of uh, color work. Um, what I do, what I call it, is uh, I break it down this way. Um, the Any sort of knitting that um, includes more than one color per row or round, depending. Um, we'll talk a more about that, that, def that distinction in a bit. More color, more than one color per round or row um, is called in my book of definition. Now granted, I, and I say a lot in this, in the, in the um, blog, it's what I, the way I'm describing it and, the, and all the way through, this is just the way I do it or just the way, just my opinion. Um, it's not right. It's not wrong. It's just the way I think about it. So if you do it differently, if you think about it differently, then, you know, that's fine. I'm not going to call you right or wrong. It's just, this is the way my brain has to get it straight. So color work knitting, color work. Um, and that can be broken down into a whole bunch of different ways and their varying opinions on how that breaks down. Um, would be stranded color work, intarsia, um, you could throw some slip stitches in there, technically, um, because it looks like there's more than one color per round. In reality, with stranded color work, the, I mean, st not stranded, in, with slip stitches, there isn't, it's, you know, if you've, done, if you've done slip stitches, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and it gets kind of muddy as I go off to the end of double knitting. It gets kind of, kind of muddy as I go off towards the other end. Uh, of the, the length of things that are under the broad topic of, of color work. Um, in Tarja, we can talk a little bit about today, maybe um, definitely, I think it's next week we, or next time. The next topic is um, the fabric that is made from, from the work, but uh, we can talk a little bit about it today. Um, but so you got stranded color work, so stranded color work. So color work that is stranded. And it's called stranded because the there is normally, not always, but normally only two colors per round. And I say round because it's a heck of a lot easier when you've got a very complicated pattern to, to um, go in the round. So that the that your knitting is facing you, the front side, the right side is facing you at all times. And when you're knitting in a spiral or in a, in the round, or which is really a spiral, um, you have the the knitted side facing you, unless you are a Portuguese pearl Portuguese pearl knitter. I think I've got a friend who it just helps her hands better to do Portuguese purling. And so she does all my stranded color work or all, all my patterns that she does of mine from the back side because that's easier for her. Blows my mind. Every time I go talk to her, you know, she's got a problem. It takes me a while to get my head readjusted. She's taking classes of mine and gets my head readjusted to what she's doing, but that's just the way it's easier for her. And she has these little pins that she puts on her shoulder that keeps the yarn up here so that it keeps it tensioned and all that kind of stuff which I find just fascinating. I can't, I don't do it, but I find it fascinating. So, oh, I meant to grab that book. Oh, shoot. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Um, hold on. Okay, back again. Sorry, I just thought I had a book with me, and I didn't. Um, okay, so, um, stranded color work. I didn't know where I was. Let's try it this way. Um, Okay, this is a repeat, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stranded colorway, uh, color work, usually in the round, usually only two, two colors per round. And it, you can do that in various ways, and we'll talk about holding the yarns and stuff in a different, a different series, different part. Um, just so you know, uh, just heads up, I generally do that two-handed, so that the 
right, my right hand holds the background yarn and my foreground holds the foreground yarn. Now, uh, stranded color work breaks down, oh, let's just cause things to fall apart, sorry. Um, the <laughs> stranded color work generally um, breaks down into a couple of different categories. Um, there is just like the generic stranded color work where you have more than one color, usually two per round. Um, then there is patterning. Um, there's some Scandinavian patterning, which is similar to Fair Isle. Most of these are broken down by um, geographic locations, mostly along the Baltic Circle. Um, I will say that, that, that there are some Inuit tribes in Western United States that do um, a stranded um, color work. Um, there is some, tr the Peruvians do, it's more of intarsia in the round, but it's also some stranded color work too. It's, it's all, the definitions are all kind of, um, it's all kind of muddy and you'll, anybody you talk to says that, you know, their ray is the right way. So, um, take it for what it's worth, but generally, um, this is, you can get a lot of books if you're interested in Fair Isle. And Fair Isle part, uh, form of stranded color work. So you've got color work, you have stranded, and then below that you have Fair Isle. And, and, and from Fair Isle you have the Norwegian, you might have some Inuit, you could have some Estonian, you could have, you know, along that line. But Fair Isle generally has a set of, of um, patterns, set type of patterns, and a foreground and a background. So and I'm, I've got to figure get my head straight, or so I'm not. So I'm actually making some sense here. But you can get a series of books. This one is caught by Mary McGregor. This one is my favorite. Um, hopefully, that may be backwards. I am so sorry, but you you'll end up with things that kind of look like that. But the interesting thing about Fair Isle work is it's very classically has what's called an XOX pattern. So here is an O. Right here's a lozenge, is what they call it, and here is an X followed by another lozenge. Okay, here is another version. Um, there's some over here where the lozenge is actually, in this case, the lozenge is made up of a whole bunch of little patterns. Here is another one where the lozenge is actually kind of a star. The star kind of things like that is more of a Scandinavian, um, as I understand it. Take that with a grain of salt, but anyway. Uh, and here is the X. Here's another sort of a lozenge that's got like petals of a flower. Um, there are times when um, your lozenge can become so large that the X becomes very small. Um, let's see. Oh, here. That's a good example. Um, here's an example of where the lozenge is so big that your X just becomes these two kind of blips that sit there. So and basically the lozenge just kind of grows and the X just has to kind of go like this until it just the last top and the bottom and the only things that are left. Um, and then I was trying to see if there's other ways where the, where the X gets so large, the lozenge just kind of becomes this little tiny thing. I'm trying to see whether there's an example of that in here. Sometimes I'll do that. Maybe that's just me that does that <laughs> when I design things. But but to see that kind of worked out, um, see that any of these books that fell down, and that's another type of stranded work. Um, oh, and I have my notes too. Hello, I find all sorts of things. Um, now these are more. Uh, oh, that's the cross stitch stuff. Never mind. Um, but this this is a, a pattern of mine called Wilkins, and you can see. If I can't let's see, is this gonna be easier? Oh, kind of, sort of. Um, Wilkins, this name from my nephew, who was actually one of the ones in the night here, um, is um, there is the? Can you see that? There is the lozenge, kind of right that little square. If you don't look at the black part of it, look at the the square here, and then there is the X. Um, let's see, can I get you closer, darling? Okay, yeah, you can kind of see it this way. This is probably a little bit easier. Um, where is it? Okay, here. See, here is the lozenge, and there is the X right there. Now, there's some other little peery patterns and things in here, little smaller things, but again, lozenge and X. Um, this might be easier. Put you back over here. 
This might be easier if I can't cause this. Well, I'll do this. This might be easier here. This is another pattern um, that I've got written up, but I don't have it put out yet. Oh, can you see that on camera better? There is the lozenge, and there is the X right there. Um, but so a lot of the Fair Isle patterns have that lozenge and X. Um, here's another sweater. This is a, called the Dublin Pullover. This was an interweave knits last year. Um, you can kind of see, I've got all sorts of things over it. I don't know, the, it's in the sea, if I can say it. it's blue. Kind of there's the lozenge, kind of in that area. And there's the X. Is it focused up? You kind of look at the, the blue shapes kind of right there. There's the lozenge and there's the X. Very traditional. This particular sweater, um, every single one of these larger patterns, the blue and the brown patterns, not, not this section, but this section, every single one of those is different. Um, I know the magazine is about to kill me because, because in that case, I had to take up more real estate in the magazine because if these just repeated, it would just take a small little bit of space with the chart. But because every single chart was different, I know they shot me. I was trying to be very traditional, you know. Um, you can also take some little patterns. Um, here's one here where you've got, um, let's see, make that, there's your lozenge and there's your X, you know, there. Um, you can take small little Peary patterns. That one, is that, oh yeah, that's Adelore. Um, this one is called Adelore. That's why that one, and then this one is Knight's Banner. Um, and that's when you take little Peary patterns and just take the little patterns. They don't have to be X's and O's, but these are an, another thing that was just um, a little bit, that's a cowl and mitts. Um, I'm trying to think of anything wise. Here's another one that's pretty definable, X's and O's. This is a um, thing I do when I teach steaking. We, everybody gets this pattern. There's an X and there's the O there. Okay, if you got that, if I, if I sort of run that into the ground. Um, okay. The other thing is, is that if you're not doing that, I mean, that's what you traditional call fair isle, when you have that X's and O's or little puri patterns and that sort of thing. I have now started to, oh, I should show you this one before we get off that one. Um, this is one I actually bought in Shetland. And you can see um, the X's and O's in that as well. And then the, the, this is called a, um, is that a wave pattern, those little diamond things that sort of interlace between each other. Um, repeats too. Anyway, um, I've sort of gotten away from um, the X's and O's. I've done a lot of that. And I've been getting more into just straight stranded work, which is um, still two colors per round, still, um, still in the round. Um, there are people who do fair off flat. Um, I just don't want to be doing purling and trying to do, keep, handle all those strands. More power to you. I just rather do it in the round. Um, and, and then that involves steaking, and we'll talk about that in a bit too. But um, this is a pattern that's called Unbroken, and you can see long gone are the X's and O's. So that's why I usually call what I do stranded color work. I do some fair isle work like this over here. I do some of this. This is more generic type. Um, not generic, but more stranded work. But this is an asymmetrical pattern. You know, why in the world all of these little commas I had to design, each one goes a different way. So <laughs> it's not fun, but this works out as you, you saw from the, from if you watched last week, last time, this is the top of this one that goes like that. So this one's called Unbroken, um, and it has these sort of swooshy things of sort of the remind me of the Baroque period. Um, so I'm doing, I'm trying to think of any more examples of it. Here's another one that's more, got more, um, patterning on, and this is, um, what is this one? I never remember the name of this one. It's on my website. So that, that's that one. This one has a nice little patterning on the inside like that. This is a cowl. This is double thickness. It's not double knitted. It's just double thickness. I like that. Um, this is one that is an example of um, just plain stranded work. This is a, a, a uh, tam 
that's called uh, Mialica, because I have to have words, you know, names of things that are hard to pronounce and hard to spell. That's me. So, um, and that's the border of that. There are mitts that go with that. There are some places in this, like you can see, is that, yeah, you can see here, can you see the little, now I got the sun in the camera and I can't, and there we go. Can you see, where is it there? Hello. Right there, there's one little speck of royal blue, that hot blue that's right in there. That was, and in there too, yeah, it's right, it's right there. That is more than one color per round, but that was done later as a duplicate stitch. And you can see that on the inside, you can see where the blue, where is it right there? You can see where the, the blue, can you see that? That's that duplicate stitch going in where I take a, um, a needle, a tapestry needle, and thread it with that blue and then just go over that stitch all the way around. And it just creates a little, um, def, you know, a little, you know, thing, a little zhuzh. <laughs> oh, okay, the point of all that is that to call anything with a patterning on it um, fair isle knitting is kind of does a disservice to the people who actually do fair isle knitting um, and the people who do um, did I, did I just drop the bro yeah and to do people like this because when you look at something like this this is not fair isle knitting because the patterning is not right the technique is similar but the but the patterning is definitely not fair isle so um, that's why I've started calling everything stranded color work that kind of encompasses it all and um, and if it's specifically fair isle which is what that would be this is all natural wood except for the red natural wool um, there are no red sheep not that I know of because if they were I would buy them all because I like red <laughs> anyway okay thank you um, you can be I as I said I can be found brandonknittingdesigns.com is my website um, the blog version of what we're talking about this is not very organized I am so sorry can I try this again? Brandon Knitting Designs, Brandon, Brandon Knitting Designs.com. That's the website. The blog is found in the News and Information tab. Under Tutorials, there are a number of tutorials there as well. Ooh. Um, it's amazing what you would put under the tutorials tab, but tutorials. Steel trap brain here. Um, I am on Instagram as, I'm getting to be like my great grandmother, <laughs> Instagram as Varian Brandon. And I post a lot of projects in, um, projects in process, works in progress. And also, um, I did posted that we had with all the fog here the other day. I posted a a, um, a shot of the big coat that you hopefully saw in the last episode um, in the in the fog, which was kind of fun. Um, and then um, the Facebook page is uh, Brandon Knitting Designs. So Barry and Brandon, Barry and Brandon, Brandon Knitting Designs. Um, Twitter is if you do Twitter. I don't do Twitter, but everything I do kind of goes over to Twitter as VB Knits. So, all right, enough of me talking. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I will continue to do this because it helps me get my head straight. Today it's not straight. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys.